Okay, welcome to this uh, session. I think it would be good, given the time of the day, for us to do a prayer that involves some exercise, which is the Lord's Prayer. I was at a small Anglican church in Cloverdale and saw this done repeatedly for the children, mind you. And I thought to myself, children, nothing. And uh, so this is how it goes. Our Father who art in heaven, we're going to stand and do this, but if you want to practice now and have a dry run, you can. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Pretty simple, eh? So let's stand up and do it together. All together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I found the Lord's Prayer to be a real stabilizing influence on my own prayer life, or shall I say, in the life of prayer. Um, and uh, it's not just saying it, but expanding on it uh, that I find so helpful in my own spiritual journey. Right, to this afternoon, the challenge of homosexuality. Um, our text is, we do not lose heart. And uh, I kind of want to say, really? It's hard not to lose heart on this issue for all kinds of reasons. But most recently, uh, the BC lawyers vote, uh, which was not in favor of Trinity Western. And as I made a comment in the chapel, I feel it's highly ironic in the sense that I, I do think this, this nation functions on the basis of borrowed capital when it comes to human rights. Human rights, in my opinion, don't even make sense apart from a Christian heritage, apart from a Christian reality. What basis should humans have rights if they don't have a common creator? Um, and so, and that Christian influence certainly, I believe, gave to Canada its understanding of human rights. And now for communities of the Christian faith, um, to lose their religious freedom in the sense uh, is sad and also ironic. And the folks at Trinity have my prayers um, very much. I don't relish speaking on this topic. I'm not quite sure why I volunteered. Didn't have to speak on ethics today, but I thought if I speak on ethics, I probably need to speak to this topic. And I have some selfish reasons for doing that. I've spoken about homosexuality in our classes. My, 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 uh, pastoral ethics classes at Regent, um, but I've never done really a full lecture on it. And I, like everybody else, have been studying like crazy uh, this issue from all its perspectives. And so what I'm giving you today is really an unfinished and unformed version of a lecture that's on the way, uh, a lecture on the way. And um, we, I'm going to go for an hour, and then we're going to have discussion. And I, I would like you to listen, and I, I, I value feedback. Um, in all kinds of ways. But we're going to have some questions that you're going to respond to. And uh, I value your feedback on this talk. Uh, perhaps it's valuable for me to give this talk because you as denominations represented here maybe have or have not or are on the way to dealing with uh, making policies on this. Um, if you haven't, you most certainly probably will need to. Um, my own denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance, is in the very thick of this. Um, as are many communities. So I hope it will be valuable to you shaping your thoughts about the issue, but also much more important, helping you uh, think in a gospel way towards the persons involved in this issue. So I'm going to be, it's going to be more like a lecture rather than a, like this morning, more jumping around and getting excited. I'm going to try to, to not get too excited and try to 
uh, deal with the nuances of this discussion, hopefully well, and, and hopefully it will be interesting to you. Before I say anything about this issue, this most highly divisive and volatile ethical issue of our time, let me reassure you that I'm aware we are not just dealing with an abstract ethical issue. We're dealing with human beings that God loves and which the church must love and care for also. At the same time, we have to pay very close attention to what the Word of God speaks regarding this issue with as much objectivity and with as little fear as possible. I finally remembered the name of the person that I used in the last lecture uh, whose book on ethics is a very, very good book, um, Dennis Hollinger. Uh, he's also written a book called The Meaning of Sex, Christian Ethics and the Moral Life. And in my opinion, the chapter he's written on homosexuality is probably the best I've seen. Um, the name of the book is The Meaning of Sex, Christian Ethics and the Moral Life. And what he says by way of introduction to that book is that ethics hinges on vital distinctions and on fine-tuned nuances. So we must be diligent in this regard. Pastoral ethics and pastoral care must be distinguished, though they can never be separated on this matter. Pastoral ethics, the ethics of right and wrong, and the care of people in the midst of this. They must never be separated, but they do need to be distinguished. We need to be able to think ethically on this topic as with other topics. Let me also reassure you that I am aware that this is a multi-level discussion, and I can't hope to do justice to it in one session. Rather, I want to emphasize some things which are, in my opinion, sometimes missing in the debate. They have to do largely with the meaning of sexuality in light of human persons being image bearers of the triune God. Let me just tell you that we as a community at Regent are also in the midst of this discussion. Uh, it's very, very uh, prevalent right now. Uh, Regent faculty are unanimous on the welcoming but non-affirming position. So there are really two positions here. There's welcoming and affirming of homosexual behavior and homosexual marriage. And there's welcoming of the persons but non-affirming in terms of the position. Regent faculty are unanimous on the welcoming but non-affirming position. That is, we welcome people who are gay into our community, who are struggling with their sexual orientation, or who have sexual dysphoria. That is a state of dissatisfaction or anxiety, restlessness around sexual identity. We love persons irrespective of their orientation and welcome them to work out these issues as they journey at Regent. However, we do not affirm gay sexual relations or gay marriage and consider the expression of such relations as a violation of our community standards. Rather, as in the case of persons who are heterosexual and single, we issue the call of discipleship towards the telos of celibacy. In this regard, we recognize that we are countercultural in a number of important ways. Whereas the sex saturated culture of modernity and postmodernity expresses the value that every person has the right to sexual relations, we say that this is a fiction. Whereas our fragmented culture, and that's the truer evaluation, than modern or postmodern, as we said earlier. So whereas our fragmented culture may be outraged because the church's evaluation based on scripture and the Christian tradition insists on celibacy for persons who do not qualify for covenantal marriage, stating that it is rather therefore tragic for a person to be homosexual and unsexed, we answer that in a fallen world, the whole area of sexuality and sex is in fact tragic. Tragic is a description of the sexual experience or lack of it of just about every person I know. Some have been sexually abused and their sexual expression in marriage has forever been affected. Heterosexual persons too who are single are precluded from having sex. That could be deemed to be tragic. There are many single people who want to get married. That too is tragic. We live in a fallen world Above all, ethics done in the Christian way is not relativistic, a, sum a summation of what we do. In other words, it doesn't look at what's going on in the culture and say, this is what we do. It rather says, this is what should be done. This is what must be done. But as we said earlier, in light of who God is, in light of his identity, his, our personhood in his, in light of God's revealed will for us as humans, 
And in all these ways, we are unapologetically counter countercultural. Now, of course, the question arises, how do we speak this message in and then beyond the church? And I said a little bit this morning about speaking in the public square, and I won't reiterate that. But I do want to reiterate this, that tone is all important. Whether we're speaking in the church or outside of the church, our tone is all important. Sensitivities to persons must always be evident. This does not mean that we do not call sin, sin. From, from a, a position paper written in, uh, finished in August 2014 by the Vineyard USA, I, I quote, and by the way, uh, that's another superb resource. The Vineyard in the USA got together um, and there are a number of scholars who have, uh, who have contributed to this, and their position paper is uh, both scholarly um, and helpful and pastoral, and I do recommend it. Um, but uh, having said that, it's also incomplete, and I think they would acknowledge that too. But a quote, and I will quote from the, when I say USA Vineyard, I'm referring to their position paper of 2014, and this is one case in point. So pastoral care does not mean that we never call sin in others sin, but it does mean that we never simply see sin as dividing others from us. Rather, the line of sin runs right through the center of our own hearts. This relates to the comment I made this morning in chapel also. We can be very hypocritical in this area when our heterosexual community is so deeply plagued by brokenness and sinfulness and pornography being a case in point. How we speak in the public square has to be so wise, but speak we must. I don't think that in a liberal democracy um, we can impose our views, but we can speak to influence. We are not seeking a new Constantinian situation. Uh, there are so many reminders of the fact that the era of Constantinianism, where the church was an authority in the state, are done. And Canada is, uh, this law society, this law uh, school at Trinity Western is one example. Uh, if you go to UBC, you'll see this beautiful brick, uh, actually stone building, limestone building, that was the seminary of the United Church in, uh, in, on UBC campus. It's the most beautiful building on UBC campus. Um, today, it has just become this year the home, not of the seminary for the United Church, but the home for the School of Economics at UBC because the seminary could not afford to occupy that building anymore. And there is just a little bit of the symbolism of what, a little symbol of what's going on uh, in our country right now. And I'm not sure that really we need to worry too much about going back to the Constantinian situation. I'm not sure I want to. I would argue that the church has probably been most effective missionally when it wasn't in the Constantinian situation. And um, Numbers of authors are speaking about the fact that we are the church in exile, and I think that's, that's, that's quite wise. Uh, Lee Beach, who's at uh, McMaster Divinity School, has a book just coming out on this particular topic. And he talks about the church being in exile, but Walter Brueggemann, who writes a, um, an introduction to his book, comments on the fact that, no, we're not in exile. It's worse than that. We're in diaspora. Diaspora is when there's no hope of going back. And maybe there's no hope of going back to what we were in our Christian society. That does not lead me to feel defeated. We do not give up hope. Um, because uh, it may not be God's purpose to form a new Christian nation, but it is God's purpose to renew and restore His church and to make it effective missionally um, in ways that will, I believe, be so relevant to a culture which, because it is so broken, has so many people in desperate need. And we as the church need to be there in order to be communities of formation, in order to be communities of shalom um, in, in our world. Not power brokers, but influencers. On behalf of the triune God of grace, not the monadic God of unbridled power. Leslie Newbigin has influenced my thinking a lot in the area of mission, and that's one of the things he bemoans, is that often we as Christians speak in the marketplace, we speak on behalf of God, as if God is some kind of generic existence that might be shared along with Allah and other gods. The God we represent is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who alone is God. 
and he's the God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who's defined by love in the first instance, not power, and whose power is tempered by his love. And it's that God on whom, in behalf of whom, we must speak uh, in our culture. So now we come to the substance of the issue. Having introduced uh, what I want to do, um, let me map out uh, some of the uh, particular landing points in our journey. I want to try to move from biblical witness to tradition, to culture, and to science in order to arrive at a theology and praxis of homosexuality for the church. So my first heading, if you like, is towards a theology. I'm a systematic theologian by training, and I think of theology really as being a response to all reality. That's what a theologian does. They respond to all reality. First of all, biblical, special revelation, reality. First of all, the reality of God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, the gospel reality. That's what a, the a theologian does. But a theologian must also respond to all reality, uh, recognizing that the Word of God and, and, and Christian theology and the theology of the Trinity and the Incarnation, all those things, is first order. There's nevertheless a second order understanding that helps us form a theology over, overall. And so what I want to do first of all is talk to you about biblical ethics um, or, and, and you can't get into biblical, by, by biblical ethics I mean the interpretation of passages of scripture around this issue of homosexuality. Biblical ethics. Um, and of course you can't look at any passage of scripture without looking seriously at how you interpret it. Hermeneutics is all important in this age, in this, in, sorry, in this issue. The plain sense of scripture it seems to me to advocate, advocate for a clear-cut disavowal of homosexual acts. The plain sense of scripture um, seems to me to advocate for a clear-cut disavowal of homosexual acts. The question is being asked um, by biblical scholars and people who are debating this issue is, is there any validity to revisionist hermeneutics? In other words, um, can we look again at Leviticus? Can we look again at Romans 1? And can we reinterpret them in light of our current knowledge or in light of what was going on in the culture then? And reinterpret um, in, in a way that one might call revisionist. The second major question we have to ask in this discussion is, is there a tra trajectory across Revelation? Let me illustrate. Um, with regard to the role of women in the church, I think most people would advocate for a trajectory of divine revelation um, that moves towards the full expression of the equality of women and uh, much greater freedom for their roles. Uh, but with respect to this issue, um, what we are, what I'm going to argue is there is no such traje trajectory, traje sorry, trajectory. What's condemned in the Old Testament is condemned in the New Testament. There's no like rising uh, tide across Revelation towards an acceptance of homosexual behavior. The um, the primary texts which are on your screen are Genesis 19, 4 to 5, Leviticus 18, 22, Leviticus 20, Judges 19, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy 1. And exegetes on the affirming side have reworked all of those, have revised all of those in light of what they believe are um, compelling reasons for restating what those passages mean. Now, I cannot hope to do a biblical exegesis job with you on all of those texts. I encourage your reading in them, however. Part of what I want to do today is that if you're considering this issue, you'll know what at least the building blocks are. You'll know what the areas are where we need to study to make sure that we know are informed in order to make a good decision. Um, basically, affirming writers, so people who affirm homosexual practice, argue for a short list of seven texts that are up here. Um, while non-affirming writers argue for a much wider field of texts which they deem to be essential to determine how Scripture speaks on this subject. Um, the textual roadmap, however, is these seven main texts. And so I bring them before you, and I'm just going to make a comment on one or two of them. At, at, so Leviticus 18, 22 and 20, verse 13. 
Some people have put these two, two together as one text. Um, so it's a bit confusing. In the Vineyard USA document, they say there are seven great texts or seven texts. And actually, then they list them, and there's eight. Um, so that's not, I think what they intend us to do is put Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, verse 13. Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. If a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Now, the penalty was removed in later Jewish history, but the seriousness of that crime main is maintained throughout Jewish history. Romans 1, which I'm sure you all know. Let me just maybe read a verse or two of it. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised, amen, and so on. And at issue here is the background of Paul's statements. Affirming writers do not like to see him drawing largely on the, uh, do not see him as drawing largely on the creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2, while non-affirming writers make this a key factor in the Romans text. And I think rightly so, that the creation account is in view here. With regard to Romans 1, N.T. Wright says the following in his uh, Communion and Koinonia, he raises the possibility that homosexuality reached its greatest expression at the high point of both Athens and Rome as civilizations and wonders if there is a comparison with the current stage of Western civilizations. In other words, first thing we need to realize is that the New Testament people of God are very aware of homosexuality. It's rife. So it's not as if we're in a new culture where all of a sudden homosexuality is a problem. It's been around for a long time. If one looks at the ancient world, there is, of course, evidence of same-sex behavior in many contexts and settings. But it is noticeable, noticeable that the best-known evidence comes from the high imperial days of Athens on the one hand and the high imperial days of Rome on the other. Think of Nero, and indeed Paul may have been thinking of Nero. I just wonder, says Wright, if there is any mileage in cultural analysis of homosexual behavior as a feature of cultures which themselves multiply and degenerate in the way that great empires multiply and de degenerate, with money flowing in, arrogance and power flowing out, systemic violence on the borders, and systemic luxury at the center. So he's saying it's, it's so similar. Um, then 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1 both contain the terms, um, uh, uh, terms that uh, are thought to refer directly to uh, homosexual behavior. 1 Corinthians 1 has the word malakoi. So let me read that context. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. And that's the translation of um, Malachi, nor thieves, nor the th greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, sorry, I think I, no, neither the, the sexually immoral, uh, nor idolaters, nor ad adulterers, I believe is a uh, translation of Malachi, and the other, uh, many who have sex with men, is a translation of arsenokoitai. Um, and that these are the two words that are used, among other sins that are indicative of someone who is not going to inherit the kingdom of God if this kind of behavior persists in their lives. And then he says, and this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So um, in both 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Timothy 1, the key issue is the meaning of the Greek word arsenokoitai. The, the NIV um, of 1 Corinthians translates two terms, malakoi and arsenokoitai, by the phrase, sorry, men who have sex with men. That's, that, that, that is translating two, um, two words. In 1 Timothy, arsenokoitai is translated as those practicing homosexuality. Non-affirming writers are confident that arsenokoitai is made up from meta arsenos koitain, which means with, with man, lie with man. Uh, with man, lie with in Leviticus, and it's a translation of Leviticus 18.22. Affirming writers, of course, dispute uh, or ignore this. Let me give you then, um, so it seems to me as I look at these texts, that the, as I look at these texts, they seem pretty straightforward, and uh, they don't look like they have any uh, cultural influence upon them that isn't transcultural. But the affirming hermeneutics um, have uh, prep, uh, represented um, 
a number of uh, ways of being revisionistic towards these uh, passages. So first, and I, I will go through these with you very quickly. First of all, irrelevance. One by one, the seven texts are found to be irrelevant to the ethics of LGBT sexuality for today. Um, so for example, the two narrative passages, namely Genesis that has to do with Sodom and Judges 19, uh, describe a context of the problem is not homosexuality, it's inhospitality and rape. And further, later citations of the Sodom story in the prophets and by Jesus show that the essential sin of Sodom as a city was one of wealth and injustice. Therefore, these texts are not really about homosexuality and they're irrelevant to the subject of consenting adult homosexual relations today. Um, the prescriptions of the Levitical Holiness Code are found in the context of purity laws. So, for instance, having intercourse during a woman's menstruation is per forbidden because of her uncleanness. The term abomination refers to Israel's purity legislation in the light of ancient Near Eastern prostitution in the fertility cults. The condemnation of homosexual activity as abomination is based solely upon Israel's cultic ritual concerns and not upon universally applicable moral ethical considerations. Then further, if one considers the New Testament review of the Mosaic law, it, it, it is clear that Christians today do not believe that such purity laws still apply. We do not obey the injunction about a woman's menstruation and we do not apply the, the food laws since Jesus declared all foods clean, thereby abrogating the Mosaic purity laws. Therefore, the Hol Holiness Code is not relevant to the issue of consenting adult homosexuality today. Um, third uh, expression of this irrelevance uh, is when one places Paul's prohibitions in historical and social context, his statements are also rendered irrelevant. Homosexual activity in the Greco-Roman world was performed by heterosexual males on younger boys, pederasty, who were often slaves within a worldview where heterosexual sex was between the superior male and the inferior female, patriarchy or misogyny, and between the adult citizen and the lower status boy or slave. It, always there, it was always therefore an exploitative act. Some further, there was no evidence that the ancients understood sexual orientation like we do today. The Greco-Roman literature shows no knowledge of ongoing homosexual or lesbian love between consenting adults. Paul would not have been able to conceive of such a friendship, and so on, and so the story goes. Textual, iso textual isolation is the next uh, technique for um, seeing a different interpretation. One of the fundamental principles of biblical hermeneutics is that biblical texts should be interpreted in the light of other biblical texts, especially when they do or seem to refer to one another. The term uh, is sometimes called intertextuality. Uh, while certain affirming scholars may discuss these links in general, the literature undermines this principle. Now you can see uh, why it is that this becomes a divide between conservatism and liberalism with respect to theology. So one of the foundation stones of uh, conservative evangelical theology, or just conservative orthodox theology, but it's broadened out, is that scriptures must be interpreted in light of all other scripture. Um, and when the affirming scholars re uh, re choose not to do this, uh, you can see that there is um, already a view of scripture which is at, at stake. Um, third, contextual distance. Um, uh, contextual distance is similar to the idea of irrelevancy. Ethical consistency. Um, this relates to, you know, my, my statement earlier to, to, to you today could have been deemed as a way of dismissing homosexual practice as being wrong when I said, there's so much heterosexual challenge in the church today, you know, why do we make so much of this one and, uh, and, and so little of that one? But the truth is, I want to make something of both of them, because both of them are violations of scriptural teaching and theological principles. Um, it is always valid to expose hypocrisy. It is certainly inconsistent to apply one standard to homosexual practice and another to divorce and remarriage or heterosexual premarital extramarital sex. Um, and, and the spirit of this in affirmative writers, I hear and I resonate with it. There's a lot to be said for consistency. However, um, as the uh, article from the Vineyard 
indicates it would be inconsistent if biblical texts were interpreted towards conformity on homosexuality and towards liberty on slavery, marriage and gender equality, if there was no difference in the way Scripture speaks to these issues. Sp scripture speaks to these issues in different ways, and we have to make the nuances that are appropriately made. Textual inversion is um, the final one of these uh, hermeneutical methodologies for discounting the texts. Um, so let me, let me talk about an example that is an example of doing textual introversion or, or inversion. Paul's whole approach is to discern between issues that are not of the essence of the kingdom, food and drink, here I'm quoting directly from the Vineyard document. Paul's whole approach is to discern between issues that are not of the essence of the kingdom, food and drink, and those that are of the essence of the kingdom, fleeing or being transformed from idolatry and sexual immorality. His approach is to distinguish between issues of conscience and issues of sexual morality and obedience. This is particularly obvious because immediately before Romans 14, Paul says this in Romans 13, 12 to 14. So background here. Romans 14 is sometimes appealed to as a passage uh, by affirming theologians who say, this is a Romans 14 issue. Some Christians think it's okay for homosexuals to have homosexual behavior, uh, engage in homosexual acts, and some don't. We must respect each other and learn to live together as the people of God in that regard. Um, but as this statement um, uh, reflects his approach, um, Paul's, Paul's approach is to distinguish between issues of conscience and issues of sexual morality and obedience right in that context. Um, so Paul says in Romans 13, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light and let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. To argue, says this vineyard document, that what Paul clearly places in the category of disputable matters of conscience belongs in the former matters of sins to put aside is not simply to misconstrue, misconstrue Paul's teaching, it is to invert it. It is completely to invert it. They go on to say that one cannot read Ken Wilson's paper. Now, Ken Wilson was a vineyard pastor who wrote for the affirming position, and uh, one cannot read Ken Wilson's paper without hearing either intentional or unintentional echoes of liberal Protestantism's method of beginning with human experience rather than scripture and tradition. His book starts with his experience of people in his church and then adjusts the meaning of scripture from any consensus understanding to his own highly eccentric reading of Romans 14. It's as if Ken has predetermined what scripture must say to fit his limited experience rather than allowing Scripture and the Universal Church's historical interpretation of Scripture to determine his beliefs. So this relates um, to the weighing of the issues. Biblical ethics, studying the biblical passages involves asking the question, is there any validity to revisionist hermeneutics? Is there a trajectory across Revelation? And now, as a result of that, what weight does this issue carry? That's the huge challenge in this. So even within the Anglican communion right now, there have been those who are not affirming, but have believed they should stay within a certain, uh, the, the Anglican Church of Canada, and others who've said, no, I, I, I must take a stand. This is an authority of scripture issue for me. I, we are going to start a new denomination. And so you have the Anglican Church, uh, the Ang Anglican Church in Canada, um, the, new, the new reform movement. Have I got the right term there? I'm part of one of those churches, so I should know. But... Um, that's the one. Thank you. Anglican Network in Canada. A-N-I-C. ANIC. Yeah, they're having their synod this weekend. Anyway, point is that this is a, a different weighing of the issue. A different weighings of the issue. And I guess what I'm trying to stress here at this point is that a number of scholars uh, within the wider Christian community have tried to weigh this as merely a Romans 14 issue of conscience. And um, uh, that I, I find very, uh, very, very great difficulty with. And let me quote to you from N.T. Wright, who is uh, so helpful on, in this regard and quite strong. This is why Paul could be so clear that food and drink and special days are not what the kingdom of God is really about. It is also why Paul could be so clear that the kingdom of God was about personal and moral transformation so that those who showed no signs of transformation would never enter it. 
1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. The point is this, when Paul appeals for tolerance in the church, says right, the issues over which he is saying, sorry, the, the, the issues over which he is saying there should be no quarrels are precisely the issues where there were cultural boundary markers, especially between Jewish and Gentile Christians. He is not being arbitrary and selecting some apparently ethical issues to go soft on while remaining firm on others. The things about which Christians must be prepared to agree or disagree are the things which would otherwise divide the church along ethnic lines. Then when commenting on Philippians, Wright has this to say, at this point there can be no dispute, no room for divergent opinions, no room in other words for someone to say, some Christians practice fornication, others think, think it's wrong, so we should toler be tolerant of one another. Or to say, some Christians lose their tempers, others think it's wrong, so we should tolerate one another. There is no place for immorality and no place for anger, slander, and the like. And then again, when discussing 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, N.T. Wright says, not for one minute does he contemplate saying, some of us believe in maintaining traditional taboos on sexual relations within prescribed family limits. Others think, think these are now irrelevant in Christ, so both sides must respect the other. No, he says, throw him out. So in light of this larger tra 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 trajectory, um, and here again I quote from the Vineyard document, and the whole thread of Paul's treatment of the subject in 1 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 11 and Romans 14, to suggest, as Ken Wilson does, that first order moral concerns are in his disputable issues category is to entirely invert what Paul is saying. One cannot read Ken Wilson's paper without hearing either intentional or unintentional echoes of liberal Protestantism's method of beginning with human experience, as we said earlier. So the one issue, is this a Romans 14 issue? I would have to say no. Um, a much deeper and more challenging issue is even if you are of a non-affirming position and you're part of a denomination that takes an opposite position, what do you do then? Um, that makes, the, the, the question that's being um, begged in that case is which is the view, what is the view of scripture that undergirds that? Um, I'm very much for making sure that the people of God stay one as much as they possibly can. And we as evangelical Protestants, we are the worst. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm not in my text here. Who cares? I just off in this little thing here. Can I, can I say something about missional church planting or just church planting or, or this whole thing about we as evangelicals have an appalling understanding of Catholicity. Jesus' most powerful strategy for mission is unity. Because Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer, and he said to, uh, he said to, to his father, that they may be one father even as we are one. Our oneness reflects something in the Godhead. And then he says, that the world may know that you have sent me. And it becomes very missional. And so I don't want to be in any way heard to not be Catholic. Catholicity is important. Um, when you plant a church because you want to be emergent, I'm all for being emergent, but stay connected. Stay Catholic. By Catholic, I mean small c. Be part of the universal church. Uh, you see, you have, the, you have the great Catholic, Roman Catholic tradition, which prides itself on Catholicity. But the Eastern Orthodox say, no, we are the Catholic. We are the, we are the older than you anyway. So we, we are the people who really know about Catholicity. Um, Miroslav Wolf, V-O-L-F. If you want to read a great book on Catholicity and on the relationship between the nature of the Trinity and the Church and unity, his book, After Our Likeness, The Church and the Image of the Trinity, is superb. And he actually makes a case for the fact that he thinks free churches, capital F, show a greater potential for being Catholic than any of the other two traditions. Because the other two traditions really equate Catholicity with institution, with organization. And you know, there is something to be said about that. It is uh, incarnational, Christological in its, in, its, in its source. I like that about it. But he says, you know, free churches, and he would list all the churches that you're a part of today, you have a great opportunity to be Catholic. Why? Because you can welcome anybody in, into your communion service. If they know Jesus, and it doesn't matter whether they're Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, if they know Jesus, they can break bread at your altar. You may not be able to break bread at their altar, but you can break bread, they can break bread at your altar. And we have a great opportunity for Catholicity. So, you know, since the time of the Reformation, we've just had division after division after division. It's enough already.
Yeah. Um, and we're all guilty of it. We're all part of it. And I just have to trust that God and his sovereignty is using this variegated unity somehow to speak uh, missionally in the way that he wants to speak. So what I'm about to say, I just want to be said in that backdrop. I believe in Catholicity. I'm not for dividing churches. But there is some point at which Catholicity is not the ultimate value. There is the value of the Word of God. And uh, I was, I've been very helped in this regard by Karl Barth, who, t who talked about ecclesiology and pneumatology. And he was really reacting to, this, to the words that, okay, unless you're part of one of the two, two great traditions, you're not really part of the church. And he, he responded by saying, there is a pneumatology. That is, where is the spirit at work? Are we to assume just because a church is part of an institutional movement that it's a church? Or is there a place for the presence of Christ felt in his church by the power of the Holy Spirit? So, you know, those, those things are, um, those things are, are important. Um, but on what basis would you ever divide? And it would have to be on the basis of the main things that are the plain things, which are the creedal things, which are the confessional things. The Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, for example, or the Apostles' Creed, even more minimally, minimally or, um, or Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6, for example, which is, I think, the first creed, in my opinion. But the point is that um, all of those are grounded in a view of the Word of God, says that the Word of God is the inspired, God-breathed, authoritative um, source of the Word of God and is the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. So I have to, I have to take the position of that there are times when based on the way in which the Word of God is handled, then we must, um, uh, therefore, on the basis of the authority of the Word of God, uh, Catholicity must take second place, I think. And that's a point for discussion, I'm sure. Um, next point here, uh, under, sorry, I, I, I failed to show that to you. I will, you'll get this when you get your slides. The fourth thing under the subject of biblical ethics is, does the absence of this issue in Jesus' teaching mean anything? You've probably heard this argument. Jesus never refers to homosexuality, therefore it can't be that important. So, for example, and I'm taking this again from the Vineyard USA document, Rogers, uh, one of the scholars that's quoted on the affirming side, says that homosexuality Sorry, in his book, Homosexuality, notes that the debate is focused on at most eight texts and then adds, none of these texts is about Jesus, nor do they include any of his words. Um, so, notice I put the word absence in inverted commas. That's because I don't actually believe it is absent. When Jesus speaks against marital unfaithfulness in the two passages in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, he uses the word porneia. And one line of interpretation of that word porneia is that it, it's, it's, its meaning is the, the, the illicit sexual activity of every kind in the Levitical holy, holiness code, which included incest, adultery, and homosexuality, and bestiality. So it's possible that Jesus meant to include that in porneia. That, that's a very difficult one to prove. Um, porneia is hotly debated in the marriage and divorce issue. Um, but, I, so I think he, he may have had it in his mind, but, he, but here's some things to think about in this regard. That he doesn't speak about it is not surprising in my judgment. No Jew would challenge the idea that homosexual behavior was morally okay. Jesus simply doesn't need to speak about it. It's assumed by his ratifying of the Torah in the Sermon on the Mount that he accepts the morality of it that it represents. Furthermore, Jesus didn't speak about bestiality. Does that mean bestiality is okay? So we don't assume, um, we don't assume that he approved of uh, homosexuality because he doesn't mention, mention it. So, we're on our way. Point number one, the texts. And I've done a very skimpy job of looking at all the texts in detail. Uh, you're a New Testament scholar, please forgive me, but you know, the New Testament scholars are developing those. Um, and uh, let me just say, 
I can't talk about them today, but in my study of them, I'm absolutely convinced that revisionist positions just do not hold water. Um, so I need to say that. Um, secondly, the place of tradition. The place of tradition in culture. Oh, sorry, the place of tradition in this issue. Um, if you are going to overturn an ethical judgment that's 20 centuries long, 2,000 years long, I should say, you, you, you better be sure of yourself. Homosexuality and homoeroticism is well known in the ancient Near Eastern culture and in Hellenistic culture and is consistently spoken against as inappropriate for the covenant people of God. And this has been the position of the church for centuries. There is a Catholicity about this, a broad Catholicity about the witness of tradition. Wolfhart, Wolfhart uh, Pannenberg, uh, who is very fine theologian from Germany, um, in an article called Should We Support Gay Marriage, comma, No. Um, I would argue that he's possibly the most eminent contemporary theologian of our time. And he's the director of the Institute of Ecumenical Theology. Uh, he, he wrote an article, and Marcus Bachmiel translated it for the Church Times, and I'm just going to read a paragraph of it, with respect to the witness of tradition. Here lies the boundary of a Christian church that knows itself to be bound by the authority of Scripture. Those who urge the church to change the norm of its teaching on this matter must know that they are promoting schism. If a church were to let itself be pushed to the point where it ceased to treat homosexual activity as a departure from the biblical norm and recognized homosexual unions as a personal partnership of love equivalent to marriage, such a church would stand no longer on biblical ground but against the unequivocal witness of Scripture. A church that took this step would cease to be one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, this is Wolfhart Pannenberg, P-A-N-N-E-N-B-E-R-G. Uh, sorry, once again, I, oh, do I have his, I don't think I have his quote here. No, I don't have his quote on this. Um, so we're at the place of tradition. Um, <laughs> Despite the events of the past weeks in which it appeared that the current pope was looking for a change of some nature in the Roman Catholic Church's stance on homosexuality, the church's position is that the homosexual act is a seriously disordered act. Now, what happened in the last two weeks is stunning. And I don't know if you were watching this. Um, and I've been asking Hans Burzma, who knows the Catholic Church pretty well, for his interpretation of what's going on uh, in the papacy just now. And uh, there are theories going about such that this pope does not believe in papal infallibility, um, that he is a liberal, that he's a liberal Catholic, and that he's pushing this agenda. Uh, so far, the Catholic Church has not changed its position. I'm thankful for that. I really believe that the Roman Catholic Church is a bit of a cover for us in culture. If the, if the Roman Catholic Church changes its position on this, we're hooped. To use very academic language, yeah. <laughs> Third, the place of culture. Um, always when you interpret a passage, you're looking for what's transcultural. And uh, I, let, you know, I cannot do all the work on all the biblical passages, but let me quote to you from Pannenberg again as he talks about his interaction with the biblical text and says, the biblical assessments of homosexual practice are unambiguous in their rejection and all its statements on the subject agree without exception. The Holiness Code of Leviticus, of Leviticus incontrovertibly affirms you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, 
It is an abomination. Leviticus 20 includes homosexual behavior among the crimes meriting capital punishment. On these matters, Judaism always knew itself to be distinct from the other nations. The same distinctiveness continued to determine the New Testament statement about homosexuality. In contrast to the Hellenistic culture that took no offense at homosexual relations, in Romans, Paul includes, sorry, in Romans, Paul includes homosexual behavior among the consequences of turning away from God. In 1 Corinthians, homosexual practice belongs with fornication, adultery, idolatry, greed, drunkenness, theft, and robbery as behaviors that preclude participation in the kingdom of God. And Paul affirms that through baptism, Christians have become free from their entanglement in all these practices. So I conclude there is emphatically no trajectory. The New Testament contains not a single passage that might indicate a more positive assessment of homosexual activity to counterbalance these Pauline statements. Thus the entire biblical witness includes practicing homosexuality without exception among the kinds of behavior that give particularly striking expression to humanity's turning away from God. That was that last sentence was from the Vineyard Statement. Right, the role of science, uh, the role of culture, second, uh, third rather, the role of culture um, in interpretation I've dealt with. The role of science is, sorry, the role of science is next. Um, when do I need to be finished to leave half an hour for discussion? At 3, okay. It says 3.30 in your paper. Okay, all right. So I have three minutes left. Right. Uh, maybe I'll take five. Um, I, I, I mean, ethics, ethics. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. But um, I, I'm, I'm going to read the. Uh, I'm not going to leave the role of science out. If it was discovered there was a homosexual gene, would it make a difference? Given that we live in a fallen world and. Uh, and we're saying that homosexual behavior is a result of fallenness. Um, and it goes from orientation uh, to behavior. Um, would it make a difference? It's an interesting thing to think about. I'll tell you where I've been most challenged in my research lately in debunking popular cultural myths is with respect to this thing of orientation. Now, I, I'm all for saying, OK, you have an orientation. and we love you, irrespective of orientation. And what, what, hospitality, hospitality as understood in the Christian church, I think means this. It means we're unconditional, un, we're unconditioned in our acceptance of people, but we're unconditional with respect to our acceptance. Let me say this. If you come into the congregation of the people of God and you are gay, you ought to be receiving, you should be receiving a very warm welcome. You should be, in, invi you're invited to journey with the people of God. But you, what you are being invited into is a journey of discipleship. And you may belong before you believe and, be, and then believe and then behave. And, uh, you know, th there's, a, there's a possibility for all of those three things to happen in the course of the church. But the telos needs to be understood ultimately as celibacy. And that's why I think I can be affirming, non affirming, but welcoming. We have the idea, as a result of post modernity, that hospitality means I must accept everybody who comes into the church and it doesn't matter how they behave. This is post modern. This is post modern hospitality. Um, but it is not hospita hospitality that is of a biblical kind. And again, uh, I recommend my my friend and colleague Hans Burzma's work on hospitality and the cross. He makes this distinction extremely well. We invite people by way of hospitality, um, but it is unconditioned, but not unconditional. That is, we're inviting you into practices that lead towards purity, that lead towards whole wholeness. That is the nature of the gospel. That's why gospel and ethics go together. On the question of orientation, maybe all I can do because of time is throw out an article for you to think about reading. Um,
This is the article. It's got a stunning title, Against Heterosexuality. The idea of sexual orientation is artificial and inhibits Christian witness. This is a scholarly article written by a Catholic scholar in First Things, March 2014, in which he seriously questions the notion of orientation. It's only, only existed since the 1850s. And uh, he suggests that um, it was really an, an invention uh, of society um, of the 1850s in order to uh, render something uh, more um, polite or, or, or good. I, I don't have time to even uh, deal with this, this article at all. I do recommend you read it. Um, This is a quote by Alistair McIntyre, which I'll pass over. Because I want to come to arriving at a theology. We've been going towards a theology. Uh, we've been doing our biblical exegesis. We've looked at what we might call second order revelation. And we arrive at a theology, um, a theology of, uh, of homosexuality. I just want to mention this, and then I'll close. I, the one piece that I feel is missing in the discourse is the nature of the triune God. Because um, God creates in his image. And what does he do? He creates gender. Or one could say sex sexuality. Male and female created he them. What is it about God that gender reflects. Diversity, Diversity within Diversity. unity. And I know that the Trinity is not in Genesis chapter 1 expressed. You know? That's not till the New Testament, although you can find the Trinity in a veiled picture in Genesis 18. But I want to argue See, you can, you can go to Scripture, and you, can, and you can have this discussion about why homosexual behavior is long. Why, why we must love homosexuals, but we must not love homosexual behavior and encourage discipleship towards, but, but towards celibacy. And you can do it from Scripture and all the biblical passages, but I have to ask myself, why? At the deepest level, why is there a differentiation of gender within the human, the human species? And I would argue because there's differentiation within the divine being. That's why it's so important. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. It's not about whether there's three in one or two in one. The numbers don't matter. It's the issue of the concepts. It's the concepts that you have unity within diversity. You have three persons of irreducible identity who are one in essence and one in perfect communion forever. And when they create, they create a person. They create persons who reflect their own divine persons in that sense. That there is a unity... Uh, of there is equality between the sexes, male and female created he them. You can't have, a, the image of God is not reflected by males alone. It's not reflected by females alone. It's reflected by males and females together. And, and even for people who are not married, the, the sexuality was given to us so that we would be driven outside of ourselves to relate to the other. Uh, there are a whole lot of Trinitarian concepts I'd like to have got into and I don't have time. But let me just say, um, and feel, I feel this deeply, deeply passionately, that if you study the theology of the image of God, um, and he's the image of the triune God, you'll see reasons why the sexes are differentiated. And uh, the meaning of sexuality is to uh, reflect the divine being in that sexuality drives us out of ourselves to relate as equals. Jim Houston from Regent said, to know the triune God is to act like him in self-giving, in interdependence, and in boundless love. And uh, Paul Stevens quoting that goes on to say, the mystery of contemplative healthy sexuality is thoroughly grounded in the mystery of Trinitarian theology. 
How do you help single people, whether they're homosexual or heterosexual, deal with their sexuality? Um, first of all, by teaching them that our sexuality is to drive us out of ourselves relationally to connect with people. It's so that we might have community with one another and communion with God. We marry and procreate, says Paul Stevens, in the disciplines of a hungry heart, or remain a single celebrating sexual diversity, maleness and femaleness, in a co-sexual community. Sexuality is designed to turn us towards God, to make us prayerful, to evoke our faith. Um, and then when sex itself is spoken of in the book of Genesis, it is restricted to marriage between a man and a woman for, those, those, for precisely those reasons, who God is. Um, and sex itself is restricted within the concept of the marriage covenant uh, as a result of that. So um, let me just run through the slides as I finish. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about image of God theology, the meaning of sexuality. I've gone over that very quickly. Uh, you'll get all these slides. Sexuality may be defined as other-orienting energy. I, I like that. Um, and then uh, I wanted to look at uh, our, our sin and, and then our salvation and speak about the fact that God... Uh, here, this may be an important quote to end with. J.I. Packer. You know, has J.I. Packer ever spoken about the issue of homosexuality? I found this quote by Jim himself in which he says commenting on Paul's hopeful world, word for sexual sinners in 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. With some of the Corinthian Christians, Paul was celebrating the moral empowering of the Holy Spirit in heterosexual terms. With others of the Corinthians today, with others of the Corinthians, today's homosexuals are called to prove, live out, and celebrate the moral empowerment, moral empowering of the Holy Spirit in homosexual terms. This book is about what it means to do that, how practically a non-practicing but still desiring homosexual Christian can prove, live out, and celebrate the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in homosexual terms. Um, so the Word of God speaks to people who, if you accept the notion of, um, of orientation, have the homosexual orientation towards celibacy, um, but God speaks to them at any rate. Um, when you arrive at a theology, you also need to arrive at a, at a praxis and I've spoken a little bit about these things. What, what do we do with the fact that we are a community of broken people, including homosexually broken people? Um, we show hospitality. We are welcoming but non-affirming. Uh, we encourage them towards baptism, towards uh, transformation, and towards baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, I meant there was one slide there, I think. Here's the bibliography. It's a very, oh, I guess you need to see the slide, don't you? So here's the bibliography. Um, oh no, it's going to the very bottom again. PowerPoint's great when it works. Yeah, so here's the bibliography. And I will send this to you. Um, this is not a complete bibliography. It's a very small bibliography. Sometimes as a pastor, you don't have a whole lot of time to read everything. And so I chose these books. I thought they would be extremely helpful um, if you can only read a few books. And uh, Dennis Hollinger, The Meaning of Sex, which builds on his first book, which is about um, ethics in general, choosing the good. Gary Inrig's book, Pure Desire, Moral Sanity in a Sex Self-Sexual Cult, has a chapter on homosexuality, which is extremely good. Uh, Wolfhard Pannenberg, that article which I mentioned, the Vineyard USA position paper, um, and then Wesley Hill's uh, interesting work, uh, Wesley Hill's Washed and Waiting, which is um, reflections on Christian faithfulness and homosexuality. It's the idea of, uh, uh, it, th this was a, a, a homosexual person who is fully committed Christian, who has not had his orientation changed, and who is not practicing and it's the story of his, uh, his journey and very helpful. Right, I'm done. We have 20 minutes. Uh, um, rather than giving you questions, I, let me just have you react to this a little bit uh, in your groups. And then I'm going to ask somebody to be your spokesperson just to make a few comments. 
I, there can be comments on anything. There can be comments on how pathetic my presentation was. Um, there can be comments on how, um, you know, are we sensitive enough to the persons as we deal with the issue? Uh, I don't know. How, did you, how do you respond to these things? Um, I'm interested in your responses or anything you found helpful in your ministry as you've been um, interacting with people who are struggling with, uh, with homosexuality. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's do that. In fact, maybe in the last five minutes we can do precisely that together. Yeah. So just to have a little bit of discussion at your table about the things that um, impressed you most. I'm sorry I didn't get finished. But I think you've got the drift of where I'm going. I'd love to have said a whole lot more about the Trinitarian theology of, uh, of gender, but uh, you can read more on that.